I love the concept of full stack, where I can build a full web or mobile application by myself from start to finish without feeling like a cog in a machine, as it is when you're working for bigger companies. It might be that you want to build your dream startup or get a job as a software dev or build a personal project, but it's good to know how all of the pieces of a tech stack fit together. In this video, I'll explain why I use FastAPI for my backends, and then I'll take you through some essentials that will convert your apps from looking like beginner projects copied from some tutorial to something that will really impress an employer and will let you create an app that guarantees a huge reduction in the time you'll spend debugging and getting your app ready for production. We all have our favorite stacks. It's generally a good idea when you're starting to code, just pick one stack and get really good at it. If you diversify and you learn 20 languages in your first year, you're never gonna do that deep dive and you're never gonna learn the core concepts and programming that you can then apply to every other stack. I've spent a lot of time writing web apps, but lately I've started writing mobile apps as well. And since there's a lot that goes into a mobile app, I use Flutterflow, which is a low code tool. And that allows me to speed up my development time. But I write custom backends because that allows Flutterflow to just be a dumb front end and the real magic is happening on the back end. Python is my language of choice for backends because it reads like English and software engineering is hard enough without needing to know what a pointer is and how to implement a reverse binary tree just so that I can get my cat memes on the internet. So which Python framework? The three most popular and popular, by the way, is going to mean that it's well tested and that it has a really strong community, which is super important, are Django, Flask and FastAPI. I have experience with Django and it taught me a lot about the web. But Django just feels less relevant these days because if you're doing what you should be doing and reading the documentation of your framework before you do anything else, you'll find yourself learning about templating languages and SSR and whatnot, despite the fact that today, API first, API based architectures are just making more sense. Plus Django has tons and tons of boilerplate and I do not enjoy boilerplate. Flask is lightweight but it expects you to know all of the external libraries that you need to get a simple app running. Otherwise, your app just turns into a Frankenstein monster unless you know the right recipes. FastAPI is awesome. I fell in love with it as soon as I found it years ago. Auto serialization and validation, which Django and Flask make you figure out by yourself. API first, which Django isn't. Amazing documentation for total beginners. First class async support makes use of the best libraries in the Python world like Pydantic and Starlet instead of making its own version of everything like Django seems to. And well, it's fast. I normally use MongoDB as a database. The choice of database that you use is very important, so it does deserve a lot of thought. Mongo is generally my go-to for <clears throat> personal reasons. And I always wrap my apps in Docker and I usually host them like on a Kubernetes cluster in DigitalOcean or, or Linode. But once they're Dockerized, you can host them anywhere. Okay, let's turn your fast API app into a well-oiled production ready machine. The first thing to think about is your file structure. A lot of these tutorials for fast API have this bad habit of ramming everything into main.py and then running the roots on the app object, which will f you in about five seconds in a production environment. There's a lot of ways you can do file structure. You just need to practice it and find your preference. FastAPI is more versatile than Django, but you do need a starting point. You need to develop your own style of organizing your models and what code to put where and how to wire up authentication, etc., etc. What I do is I mix things that I learned from Django and describe the cruft. Now, there are a few architectural patterns that we can borrow from. In Django, for example, you have MVT, Rails uses MVC, there's also MVU and Viper and MVM and so on. Point of these is actually just to separate the layers so that, for example, the view layer, which contains the roots, doesn't talk to the database directly. For this, we create models and we put those in a models folder. Django actually has a really good way of defining models, so I steal that. I name the file the name of the model, and then inside of that file I create a class with that same name. Here I'll just call it entity, but it could be cats, bookings, stripe payments, Pokemon characters. Whatever it is, it's known as an entity, so I'll just call it that. But you'd call it whatever it is. That depends on what your app does. 
One useful convention is to name the model in singular form, because each instance of this class only represents one document in NoSQL, or one row in SQL. This particular entity has a name and a description, and it's associated with a user. But you'd add whatever fields you need, and then you'd give them types. Note how Pydantic allows me to define the fields just by stating the field name and the type. Here, I'm also using a library called Beanie, and that's a Mongo library for FastAPI and it lets me instantly make this class into a database model. Now we have a models folder and it's in its own model-y space. This is sometimes called the data access layer. It's Python code that interacts with the database. Next, we'll create the view layer. This also has other names, but the point of this is to have this layer only be about exposing the API endpoints. Instead of stuffing all of this into main.py, we'll create a folder called roots and we'll create separate modules to deal with each entity. For our entity here, we'll create an entities.py, but you would create cats.py or pokemons.py or whatever you want. Now we initialize a router. You can have as many routers as you want, so don't be shy. Prefix the router with a path and tag it for the docs. You can also add dependencies like an authentication layer to kick out unauthorized users and that way you can protect all of your roots in the module. Then we import the router into main.py and add it to the app object. We might end up with a lot of routers here, but they'll only take up one line each. So the main.py real estate can still be used for more core things like database and auth initialization, app settings, cores and middleware, and generic exception handling, all that good stuff. One thing a lot of the fast API tutorials on YouTube somehow miss is the interaction with the database, which is a very, very basic thing that an app needs to be able to do. It's kind of rare that you're going to have an app that doesn't interact with the database. We've made a database model already, so let's use it. First, import the model and then do the database call. Here I'm using Beanie as my ODM, so the syntax might be different if you're using SQL Alchemy or something like that, but the principle is still the same. First, I can clean up the return statement, and I actually need to remove the leading slash because this is a subroot of entities. Now, this next part is important. The whole point of an object-oriented language like Python is that everything is an object. You should be thinking in objects. Eat objects for breakfast. Only listen to music that's about objects. Once everything is an object, FastAPI will serialize and validate everything for you, which cuts way down on bugs because you're explicitly telling the API what it's allowed to accept, and what you expect it to be returning. If it doesn't, you've done something you didn't mean to do, and FastAPI has kindly told you. We want to tell FastAPI what should be returned from this endpoint is a list of entity objects, which it'll then convert to JSON under the hood. And if its structure is wrong, it'll throw an error, and congratulations, you've just caught a bug early. We also want to assign a status code. At first, you might be tempted to use the integer code, which you can, but a better approach is to use the built-in constants from FastAPI. That makes the code read more like English. For the post request, it's similar, but with some modifications. We'll use a blank root again because the post method will root this correctly. And then we add the status code and the response model. This time, there's a body, and we'll want to use an object to coerce the input and validate as well as serialize it. You'll see the 422 error code a lot as you get used to this. And that's a good thing. It's saving you hours in bug fixing. At this point, you may realize that some model fields might not be inputs. For example, if my entity is associated with a user, let's say it's a record for a booking a user made that's unique to that user, you can get that user data from the auth token. So there's no need to ask the body to provide it again. Here, I create a Pydantic base model class with just the fields that I need. I can also make some fields optional by allowing null values on the input. The same is true for if I want to do a patch or a put request, I create a model with all of the optional fields so that only the ones in the input are handled. And now I import my create model and I use that as the input. I can use Pydantic's model dump here and give me all the fields from the input and I can also tell it to ignore anything that's missing. Now there's one critical thing here that I'm doing that I said I wouldn't do. I'm interacting with the database in the views layer. That's why it's already starting to feel a bit verbose. I'm now going to create an abstraction called a service layer. This also has other names, uh, such as the controller. 
But whatever you call it, the point of it is to separate our concerns so that we keep things decoupled and also dry. The service layer holds most of the business logic and the error handling. I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit now so I can show you a generic layer for CRUD that I use in all of my apps. There's no sense in writing all of the logic for CRUD for every entity that you're going to encounter because a lot of that logic is reusable. I can provide this code for free, by the way. Uh, just drop a comment and let me know if you'd like a copy. This is a base service for CRUD. First, I tell the layer what model it's interacting with. Then I add standard CRUD roots. For example, I get a single database document and if it's missing, I throw a 404 exception. Then here's my create logic where I take in the data and combine it with the details of the current user. I normally use Firebase authentication, so I've created an object that parses the auth token to structure the user details. The update logic has a little more to do because it also has to check if the current user owns the document they want to update. And similarly, if a user wants to delete a document, they need to own that document. Other systems and other databases have other ways of handling this type of thing, such as role-based access control and role-level security. So it may be that you'll do this slightly differently in practice. Now I have an entity service that inherits the base methods, and I can also add overwrite methods to suit the logic specific to that entity. For example, I want to send a paginated response when delivering all of the documents in this collection here. And for create and update, I need to tell the base service that the data will be delivered in the form of the entity create and entity update base models. But that's not necessary for my delete endpoint as there's no body in the request. So I can rely on the base service and emit that here. Awesome. Now, all that's left to do is to modify the view layer to make use of the service classes. And look now how clean my view layer is. I use dependency injection to pass all of the data directly into my service layer. So my view layer can concentrate on defining the root, accepting the data, and then outputting the correct response and status code. And by the way, it's good to know that you're not obliged to even give a response at all. Here in the delete endpoint, I'm simply passing the delete task to the service layer, telling the root to expect not to return anything, and then I just use the pass keyword. The 204 response will still be returned so that the front end knows that the delete was successful, but there's no need to pass pointless text in a dictionary because this is a, an API. It's not a human reading the response. The status code is more than enough. As always, thanks so much for watching to the end of the video. Now, I do have a starter template for FastAPI with all of this code included, and it really saves me a lot of time when I'm spinning up a new project. So if you want to get your hands on that, just drop a comment on the video and I can provide it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and do give this video a like if you're finding this content helpful. And I'll see you soon for another video about coding and app development. See you then.